I'm not sure if God operates with you the same way that he does with me, but in all ways, he does operate according to his own sovereign will in regards to each and every one of us on certain levels, for instance, like salvation and those kind of things. But then when it comes to the individual parts, you know, because we're all designed in a different way and that we operate, you know, and understand God at different levels at different times and different ways and different means, you know, sometimes we come to him and appreciate different parts of him at different points in our life. You know, when you're first saved, it's kind of like, you know, thumb-sucking routine, you know, where it's like, man, just just give me the loving, you know. <laughs> give me my bottle and I'm happy, you know, let me sleep. Then later on, you know, you want your diaper changed, you know, and you want, you know, kind of a little bit of crawl room, you know, and you want to kind of like let people know that, you know, hey, I got something, I got a need here, you know, and I'm not having my need met, you know, and sure enough, just like a baby, you'll cry out when your needs aren't met. But, you know, when we continue on, in Jesus, when we grow up into the fullness of the stature of the body of Christ, when we become men and women of God instead of children tossed to and fro with every women doctrine, or some new idea comes out on the internet and we run after that, or some new, ooh, you know, this is a, a socio uh, society issue that we need to get involved in, you know, and we choose to deny Jesus and go after that. I think, you know, we put those things aside when we finally grow up. You know, and mature in our relationships because principles of life was based upon the idea that discipleship and growth and maturity had to be something that we taught our children from childhood upward that we train them in the way that they should go so that when they're old they would not depart from it because we know that everyone at some point in time will fall away or fall down or fall some way but they will fail and so knowing what to do when you fail that was one of the important things that I think the Jesus people in communication within the discipleship realm really didn't learn right off the bat and it took us a while to kind of catch on to that idea because after all our parents we had just gone through this revolutionary idea of being you know away from that generation because we were the 60s you know the new baby boomers you know and so we brought into these massive changes that we wanted to make something different than the previous generation and we learned you know eventually that as we went back into scriptures, we found that there was a textbook for life that we found, oh, maybe the denominations had a point of why they did what they did when they did it. Because in some ways, you know, it's understandable within their framework with where they were at at the time that they were doing it. Or at some point in time, some other denomination may have done certain things a certain way because within their time frame and framework of where they were at, at the time they were at, they did it in a certain way so that they too could accomplish purposes that God designed for them. So I see in the reality of all of this, not a universalism of everyone coming to salvation in Jesus Christ, because that's a personal decision, not a corporate issue, but I do see that there's a wealth of material that could be gleaned from all these experiences that people have had with the scriptures, teaching us the word of God causing us to be reminded in whatever form or formula that it might minister to you and touch you in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, and cause you to redirect your attention back to God. Because we live in the last generation. We live in a generation that really doesn't have time to go back to square one and say, hey, if I had been raised a Christian, I'd be righteous. No, you wouldn't. You'd still make the same mistakes. Only they would be not quite as big as when you're a non-Christian and you get saved. Or, in some ways, the non-Christian actually sometimes knows more than the Christian does because he sees it in a different light. But every single human being that was born is carrying baggage in some way. Although we've been set free and the Son has set us free indeed, we pick up our baggage along the way based upon our experiences with Jesus. Whether we carry them or not is our choice. And most of us are carrying baggage from a bad relationship to uh, poor choice, to improper self-image, to uh, a improper knowledge of the nature of God so that our salvation is always a questionable action, whether or not we've actually been saved or we think we're saved or we don't feel saved or we think we're going to get saved. Or, you know, all these areas of conflict that we are worried about or anxious about are things that God said not to do. He said, be anxious for nothing, for in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Because once you have a realization of the knowledge of who you are in God, 
And as you mature, then you no longer are tossed to and fro with every woman doctor like little children, but you grow up into a man of God, exercising something called principles of life, like from Inter Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. And that's what we've been going through, is to determine what conflicts we're going through, like baggage that we're carrying, and what experiences of life that we've looked at and said, you know, that's part of our problem. You know, we didn't deal with this issue, and now that issue or that luggage we're carrying around is a monkey on our back and we need to do something about it. And so we were going through all six areas of conflict that are going to influence you all the days of your life and that you need to address, not in the sense of solving them, but to be aware of them and then to talk to God about them. And then we'll move on because once we begin right after this last one, we'll begin to getting into how what, who, when, where, why, in all areas of self-image, in responsibility, in conscience, in rights, in freedom, in purpose, and in friends. And we discussed how, and we won't keep reiterating it once we get into the next session after tonight or today, but we will, and we won't keep repeating, you know, what they are, but we'll just, you know, reinforce it. But we we'll just wanted to say again that we use this book, Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, as a foundation because people had always said that they didn't have a textbook with which to plan out their life and that they didn't coordinate their life with some schema or some planning or some idea of where they were going and how to get there. But that they had this idea, well, when I grow up, I want to be like... And then when they grew up, they built man caves and they started acting like children that just all of a sudden got a bunch of money so they could play and do what they want to do. And a lot of times, that's what you see as an example for Christians. You see Christians' idols or Christians' examples being football players. They're still playing games. Or, you know, some other medium that you wouldn't say is like, the example that Jesus said, because Jesus didn't say, I'm a Christian carpenter. He said, I'm the son of God. And so you see the difference that I'm saying? It's not about being a football player that makes someone famous. It's about Jesus in them that makes them sat, saved as well as someone to be a pattern after. I don't want to become like Tim Tebow. I don't want to become like, uh, I think, let's see, the Saints football quarterback. I don't want to be like any of them. I want to be me. Because you see, I'm me the way God made me and I appreciate the fact that he made me the way I am because then I could be what he wants me to be and according to the choices that I make, I could fulfill that purpose that he has for my life and then I could plan out my life according to that purpose that he reveals to me as I go forward with him day by day. And so you, the areas of conflict will always trip you up if you don't have a proper understanding of them. And the areas that we went through were the first one was assurance of salvation, that you got to know you're saved, otherwise, you know, you really, you're wasting your time. The area of self-image, that you have to understand that God made you, He loves you the way you are, you don't have to keep rearranging and making and changing and rearranging and doing something different to yourself all the time. Third one was purpose in life. Fourth one was harmony at home. Fifth one was moral purity. And you can check out those videos because they're free. They're on the internet. Wherever you're watching this one, you can just backtrack and find the rest of them. Those are six areas of conflict. And today we'll be talking about genuine friendships. And in those areas, each one of them we identify that you're carrying your baggage and everything that's stuffed in there, that baggage or that luggage, is something that your experiences has put in there because you didn't deal with it at the time that it happened. So God brings it all the way around, then he pulls open the zipper, opens up the luggage and says, see, something in there stinks. And then you have to look at it and you go, oh, and that's what the Word of God does. It opens up your luggage for you that you're carrying around that most people are looking at you saying, we're not at the airport, why are you dragging that luggage around? Because you see, Jesus wants you to be free to encounter your area of involvement in what he's doing in your life free of all the luggage and baggage that you might be carrying around even though you may have it the rest of your life depending upon how you grow and the knowledge that you learn from him according to the grace and mercy that he's extended in your life as you study and as you apply the word meaning that when you become a new creation old things are passed away all things have become new but likewise in that newness you still carry around certain ramifications that are true of your life and that's the baggage and unfortunately, the luggage is that stuff that you carry around that you did after you got saved. And then you started stuffing things in there. 
whether a bad marriage you claim that's bad, where it's really just a marriage, and then the relationship became what it was, and you guys decided what you're going to do, and you suffered the consequences of it. Or that you carried from your childhood consequences of bad training or irresponsible uh, father figures or you know, you didn't have a mother or you didn't have a father or you didn't have, you know, the upbringing that God intended for you to have in the first place. So when you got saved, he began to work with that. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff started coming out because he was opening up the baggage and the luggage and saying, get rid of this, get rid of that, get rid of that. And you went, oh, well, I like that. And you put it back in, you know, when he wasn't looking. <laughs> but now that we're mature and we're developing our life, then in basic youth conflicts, as well as using this as a foundation, we're discussing the principles of life that make us able to communicate effectively, not just to each other, but to God himself. And so you'll see that this applies in studying scripture. As a matter of fact, the very next teaser I'll give you for ahead of time is, quite bluntly, principles in applying scripture. And that's one of the first principles of life. So. We'll be getting into it really fun, you know, the next part. And this part's pretty cool right now, but I just wanted to kind of review that so you'd understand where we're coming from, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. We're going to get there by using this as a foundation because it comes from the scriptures. It'll talk about the scriptures. It'll give you those thoughts that you'll take to the scriptures and apply them as the Holy Spirit leads you. So, in genuine friendships, it says, one of the most basic human needs is intimate fellowship with others. When we try to fulfill this need without knowing or following the freedoms and responsibilities on each level of friendship, a host of lifelong conflicts results, and we miss the necessary experience of developing genuine friendships. We'll talk short and brief about this because there's a whole huge section in this book about friendships. But friendships, as you well know, operate on many different levels. You have some of your friends that are good time friends, you know, the kind that are there for your good times, but man, as soon as you got something, you know, that you want to get off your shoulders or off your chest, they don't want to hear it because it's like, ooh, you know, that's negative. Or, you know, the other kinds of friends that are like there well, as long as you got the money, you know, and you're out there partying and, you know, they're all around you and they're laughing it up and carrying on, but the first time you cry, they didn't hug you, did they? In my life, I've had the opportunity to demonstrate what true friendships are, rarely receive back valid, genuine friendships. Because a lot of times people don't know how to get to the level with which I was sharing and respond back. So they're on one level a friend, but they really didn't take the time to become a genuine friend or an intimate friend or one that Jesus said that we would become like he said he wanted us to be no longer servants, but he would call us friends. For a servant doesn't know what his master does, but a friend he confides in, and you know what he's doing. So you see, there's a goal about being a friend. A genuine friend can confide in where you're going together, what you're accomplishing. Is your friend today your quote unquote? Because I'm sure you feel like you have your true friend or your BFF, best friend, you know, forever. Is your true friend still the same one from when you first started? Or did you change it along the way and they're gone? Because that's what God wants you to deal with. Because a genuine friend is a friend forever. Friends are friends forever if the Lord's Lord of them. And a friend will not say never because the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go, in the Father's hands we know that a lifetime is not too long live as friends. Amy Grant, you know, had a chance to sing that song at a time of her life when it was very challenging for her because there were different things being done to her because of a divorce that ostracized her from the body of Christ. And how tragic it was to see whether or not genuine friendships are there by way of the trials and tribulations we go through. Because a friend will be there for you. But it's not just the platitude like that. A friend will pay the price of being your friend and they'll count the cost of staying your friend and they will go the mile and a half and extra to do that with which they would lay down their life for you. In my life I've had several friends that I laid down my life for 
And they accepted it. You know, they enjoyed it. They were participating in it. And at times, wonderful things happened for them. They grew in the Lord. They developed. They became different types of Christians, you know, and they, they grew up. I can think of quite a few right now as they flashed in my mind. But at different times also, they never really participated in where I was coming from. Or like if I had a need, I would go to the Lord alone because I couldn't come to my friend because they didn't want to know. They didn't want to deal with it. And so you will find that as we get into the levels of friendship, there are many levels. I've had individual people that I've met in rare occasions throughout the world that are instantly my friend. Intimate. Boom. We pick right up where we left off and we are friends. You know? We pray for one another. We care about one another. We are there. One of them gave me some sandals. You know, I just love the pro. You know, other people I meet on certain levels of friendship on Facebook. You know, I know them by way of words of knowledge, words of wisdom that I really don't want to tell you how and those kind of experiences because that's kind of like supernatural. But that's how God makes some friendships supernatural. Some of them are like my wife has a friend that's you know just kind of like texting. You know, they text just about every day. You know. And they're just encouraging each other, you know, in the Lord, you know, and in fellowship of some type. You know, there's a lot of those Greek words that people use for phileo and, you know, agape and sturgio and koinia, you know, and a bunch of them, you know, that are used to describe, you know, love, but really boil down to friends, you know, because most of them are really just kind of describing friends. And so, when we go through this subject of friends in the back of the book, because it will be there, you're going to discover that the cost of friendship is your life. Because it is a true scripture that says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So that statement, blood is thicker than water, is a false truism. It's not a scripture. Because the Bible says the opposite. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Because the house of the brethren is what crucified Jesus. I mean, Jesus' brothers, even his own family, were against him at times. So you'll find that the reality of a friend, if you can develop that relationship in a genuine way with God being in the midst of it, then when you become a friend of God in developing it with Him, you'll see that there's an equal part that works. Because God has an interesting way of balancing out scales. When things go down, He pushes this down to make them even. When things go up, He pushes them down to be even. In your life, God is going to even you out, no matter how roller coaster ride you think you are, or how much of a A-type personality you are, or D-type, no, not D-type, introvert, extrovert, you know, all the sanguine cholerics and all the other things that Christians used to get into to talk about what kind of personality traits they are. You know, the God trait is this, be like Jesus. <laughs> but the point being is that when you are a friend to someone, God will level it out because he'll become a friend to you. When you love the brethren, then he will even it out because he will love you. As you do so unto his brethren, he does so unto you. So if you want to be a friend of God, here's the shortcut. Be a friend to those that God has called. That simple. It's too simple, but just like Norman Humbert, I think it was his last name, or Humbert, Humbert I think, told me, even in he got to all these basic youth conflicts, and we talked about it lots of times, you know, when I was living with a Christian roommate with him, and Three other room, uh, two other roommates, and uh, I used to. He was fascinated by my mind because I'd catch on what he was saying immediately and jump to the conclusion, you know, rather than have to deal with it. He would have to teach. He was teaching Sunday school at Calvary Costa Mesa, so he knew how to be very dogmatic about a little bit at a time, little tiny picture, this, 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 and then you know, just doo -doo 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 -doo, all the way down the road for adults as well as children, <laughs> and he taught children. But he was always there, you know, and he's a neat guy. So, anyways, all the books in Christian psychology and then Christian counseling and Christian this and like Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts and any number of books that was out at the time that everybody was ranting and raving about. He'd read, you know, and he'd, he'd like had it in his library and I'd say, well, what do you think about that? And he'd go, he wouldn't say anything until I said something. Like I said, well, I kind of read the first couple chapters and I said, 
really what it boils down to, I said, if you have the Holy Spirit, that's all you need. And he goes, yeah. He says, you just trust the Holy Spirit, and that's all you need. You don't need the book. I went, oh, okay. You know, so I got to where I kind of like was thrilled about learning things in a certain way because then I could kind of like shortcut, it seemed like, the way of learning. And so I talked to him about basic youth conflicts and, you know, different things, and that is the way you were a friend. You be a friend to someone else so that God will be a friend to you because as you extend yourself out, he extends himself to you. You don't start with God to be a friend. You see, you start with God to have the ability to be a friend to someone else because you won't be able to be a friend to someone else without the Holy Spirit in you. Trust me. So, as he fills you with his spirit, it overflows to someone else and then you funnel it in a, some ways, channeling in a way, you know, kind of directing it somewhat. He directs you, but you just kind of like really let it out. But you get a chance to build this intimacy level with a person. And as you build your intimacy with that individual, and then it gets tried and tested, you know, because believe me, it'll be challenged. Then God will because you become so intimate with this person, he'll bring this back up so the scales are even. God's side, man's side. You will have equal scales and he'll lift that scale all the way up to heaven to where you're not only a friend, genuine friend to someone, but you're a friend of God. And that's why the fame of Abraham went out everywhere because he was called the friend of God. But he was also that man that had been a friend to Lot, to his servants, to many peoples all around him. Father, I thank you that you've given us a way to be a friend, to know a friend, and to realize what a friend we have in Jesus. But God, now we could be that friend to someone else. We could be Jesus as a friend to someone that may need a friend. So Father, I thank you that by your Spirit you're taking the principles of life and you're making them real in our life because you are the author of life. And as long as we have you, Jesus, as long as we know you and you fill us with your spirit, then we can have life because he who hath the Son hath life and he who has not the Son of God hath not life. So Jesus, if we don't have you, we need you. If you don't inhabit us, we can't do what you want us to do. So develop in us this perspective of seeing, yes, our luggage and our baggage, but more so the need in someone else to have a friend and the need in us to be a friend so we can be friends with you, O Lord, o Lord Most High, and that, God, we could find the friendships in life that you desire for us to have, as you said, by the love we have for one another, would all men know that you're my disciples indeed. Teach us, O Lord, Instruct us in the way that we should go. Guide us by your right hand. And let us discover in these books and in this study the principles of life. How to live. Not just how to think. Not just how to have a positive thinking. Not just to have an experience with you occasionally. But how to have a real life in body, soul, spirit, mind, and strength, in all that encompasses in us, so that we would not just experience it in this dimension of the reality of the physical plane, but we would experience it in our emotional and our spiritual realities that we are yet to experience completely as you develop us into the image of the likeness of the Son of God who lives in us and dwells with us now. So Father, I thank you that you have used the foolish to confound the wise and used the wise to teach the foolish. And that in the balance of the scales, we find that we're all even. And that you, by your Spirit, can allow us to know you. And I can't think of any better place to be than knowing you. So Jesus, walk within the midst of the people today as they replay back maybe those six tapes and areas of conflict that they have with their baggage and luggage and everything that they're carrying around. And that they learn how to just kind of, if they can't just throw it down and leave it on the ground and then crawl up on that cross and get crucified, then I pray that God, you would help them to open up the luggage. Open up the baggage, you know, so you can look inside and begin to take out those things that don't belong. And that you could help me and help others that are becoming friends to be baggage handlers to be luggage carriers, that we might be servants to each other, 
that we might help each other with our butt lag, with our luggage, our bag, our luggage, <laughs> with our luggage and our baggage, and that we can find in you, Jesus, the freedom that you promised us, that we would not be carrying these things around that are so easily burdening us down, but that we would leave them aside for the joy and the love that we could abide in you today. Thank you, God, for being you, for being my friend. Amen. God bless you. It's going to be fun, because the next one's principles. Ooh, the first principle. And hopefully we'll have the chalkboard up, or the whiteboard back up. But in the meantime, we were using this set, such as it is, because of the lights and everything else that we're still remodeling. So I pray that the Lord will take you and make you into what He wants you to be and that you would be willing to be made into what you may not see yet the design He has in mind, but that you begin to find out that you like what He's doing with you.